One thing that I've realized when it comes to driving long distances is it's difficult to adjust to a vehicle that doesn't have um, cruise control. I don't know if you've ever had that issue. If you get into a vehicle, if you're used to cruise control and then you get into a vehicle without cruise control, that can be hard to adjust to, especially on a long trip. Our family van has that feature of cruise control, which is a blessing. While driving on the highway, I'll accelerate to the legal speed limit and then I'll, I will engage in that I will engage the cruise control and from that point onward I don't need to concern myself with maintaining the speed or adjusting for hills and, and valleys along the road and whenever the car encounters an incline or a decline the system automatically adjusts the fuel flow to ensure a steady and consistent pace unaffected by terrain well in the same way as a believer I move at an even pace along life's highway, whether the road leads through the even plains or over rugged mountains, when the going gets tough, I have strength for every challenge because of the one who has control over me. Regardless of what is happening around me, I can have joy and peace within, no matter my circumstance. So how is that possible? How can a believer enjoy peace when they're in the middle of troubling circumstances? How can they have love towards perhaps someone who has wronged them? How can a believer remain faithful to God, perhaps in the midst of some trialing situations? It's possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that. As he is able to control the believer's life. In our last lesson on the Holy Spirit and his work in the filling ministry, we learn this truth that the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit is a special work of the Spirit in the life of the believer where the Holy Spirit takes full control over that individual. And that emphasis there is on the control of the Holy Spirit. Now I have here some quotes by various individuals that talk about self-control. For instance, Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor, stated this about self-control, quote, you have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. Aristotle would go on to say this about self-control. He said, self-control. What lies in our power to do, it lies in our power not to do. Then, of course, we have Frederick Nietzsche, who was a German philosopher that argued that God is dead. And this is what he said about self-control. He said, he who cannot obey himself will be commanded. That is the nature of living creatures. Now, all those quotes I've just read, they come from a, a worldly perspective, which revolves around the topic of self-control. And in each of those quotes, these men represent worldly thinking. They each have their own ideas about how it is that they can gain power. In their own way, what they all believed to a certain extent was, was that power comes through self-control. The problem is real power cannot be found in the self. We know that last week. We're going to highlight that again. Real power does not come from the self. Real power comes from the strength that God supplies. I remember reading an obituary of a man who found this truth out the hard way the obituary of Ernest M. Dickerman, age 87. He was considered the granddad of the Eastern Wilderness by the Sierra Club. Said he committed suicide at his cabin in the mountains of Buffalo Gap, Virginia. And the obituary stated the following. He was 87. He was found under a cherry tree behind his cabin, having shot himself, police said. In a note to his family, Mr. Dickerman said that he took his own life as he had long planned to do after the infirmities of age left him unable to, these are in his words, master my own fate in the wilds of this wild country. Uh, th this was a man who had extended himself out in such a way where his search for strength in himself, in himself, proved to be fruitless. It proved to be fruitless. There is only so much we can do in our strength. But the key the key to spiritual victory, it lies in the reality that the Spirit of God desires that we would allow him to control us. Think of it this way. I like equations, okay? Self 
equals defeat. Pretty straightforward. That is self-effort, self-effort apart from God's strength and his ability, his power that he provides. From that is defeat. In fact, what we're going to discover in our time together will be this truth that God has given various responsibilities in the New Testament that will cause one to be filled with his spirit. God has given various responsibilities in the New Testament that will cause one to be filled with with his spirit. And this is where power is located. Real power is not found in the self. It's found in the strength that God supplies through his spirit. And the believer is commanded to be filled with the spirit. In fact, in our time together, we're going to observe three God-given responsibilities from the New Testament that will cause us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But before we get to those responsibilities, I want us to begin our time by looking at the command that we see in Scripture. And the command is in the New Testament for the believer. It's connected to this particular aspect of the Spirit's ministry. It's connected to the filling ministry. We see it in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where we read, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And the contrast there, it's a powerful contrast. In the same way where one can come under the influence of alcoholic beverage, the command that God has given is this, be filled with the Spirit. As children of God, we are called to be filled with the Spirit. We could also translate this command in the following way, be controlled by the Spirit. And the reason why uh, we might can translate this command in this way is because of the layout of the Greek, to be controlled by the Spirit or, or to be filled with the Spirit. It is a, a command where in the Greek, if you parse that Greek verb out to be filled, you parse that Greek verb out, you will end up with a verb, present, passive imperative. And the verb is obvious. Present tense means that this filling should be all the time in, in the life of the believer, And the imperative simply means that this is not an option. This is a command that God has given. Uh, This is not an option. In the mind of God, Paul is saying here that a a believer is called to be filled all the time, and there are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But that passive form in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 is is important. I want to note that. We remember from our 15th lesson, where we studied the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit, that if a verb is in the active form, then that tells us that the subject is actively engaged with the verb. It's actively engaged with the verb. But here in Ephesians 5.18, this command, you'll know, it's in the passive form. You have a verb, present, passive, imperative. Just underline passive in your mind, if you will. How, how can this be? We're, com- we're commanded in Scripture to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, yet with this command in the passive form, it's It is the Holy Spirit who wields this control in the life of the believer. So on one side, because of this this passive form, it almost appears as though we can do nothing. However, we find that this command is in the imperative. It's a command. We are called to be filled with the Spirit of God. It almost appears as though in the Greek there is this uh, contradiction, if you will, But the answer is simple, and it comes down to the form of a question. Since this command is in the imperative, then what responsibilities are we given in order to be under the control of the Holy Spirit? The command is there, be under the control of the Holy Spirit. So then what are our responsibilities? Well, I believe as we track through the New Testament, as we look at this important ministry of the Holy Spirit, we're going to find three responsibilities. And we're going to begin with that first one. It's do not quench the Spirit of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. Do not quench the Spirit of God. Now, you've probably uh, heard this verse a lot of times. It can be easy to skim over it, to miss out on, um, to miss it and its importance on life, especially since it is connected to the Spirit's control over your life and mine. As Paul would give instruction to uh, this church in Thessalonica, he would give them some grace age instruction. Interestingly, he nowhere says anything about placing oneself under the law. You look at what he says to the believer there in 1 Thessalonians. A lot of instruction within this church age of grace to the believer. Nothing about going back to the law. That's a side note. He does say, however, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the spirit. 
Do not quench the spirit. And so the imperative is a command. In Greek, it's the word quench here in the text. To quench for the believer is a verb present. Now, it's not a passive form. It's an active form. Note that. It's a verb, present, active, imperative. So the responsibility now is up to the believer since it is in the active form. Now, this Greek word for quench is uh, benoimi. It's found in Matthew 12, 20, where it's used in the physical sense of a smoldering wick that was not put out. This Greek word is also used in a spiritual sense. I'd like to ask that you turn with me to Ephesians for a moment. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'd like us to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians chapter 6. Towards the end of this letter to the believers in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul writes about the full armor of God. Now, this is what the believer is to do with the full armor of God. Look with me, verses 10 and 11. Verse 10, we read, Finally, be strong in the Lord, And in the strength of his might, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. In this spiritual battle, our spiritual enemy, he's going to hurl flaming arrows at us to try to wound us. We're not talking about physical arrows, but we are in a spiritual battle. So what are we to do when the enemy hurls those flaming arrows at us? Well, look at verse 16. It says, In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Well, the type of shield that Paul had in mind was a Roman shield. It was made of wood. And according to the Bible Knowledge Commentary, this Roman shield was overlaid with linen and leather in order to absorb the fiery arrows. It was a, a powerful shield. In fact, it was a shield used to protect the other armor uh, that, that one would wear. When we take up the shield of faith, that piece of armor is a critical piece of armor in our spiritual life. When we take up the shield of faith, that shield will extinguish or quench. And, and that, that same word for extinguish is the same Greek word for quench in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. This armor will quench those flaming arrows that will come. By the way, as a believer, there is a target on your back. The enemy wants to take you down. There is a target on your kids' backs, on your grandkids. There is a target on your marriage. There is a target on the body of Christ. Yet even though we have this target on us as believers, God has provided the necessary pieces of armor that, will, that we are to put on in the Christian life. Now, now, it seemed to me that by this statement in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, 9, 19, some would think that it could be possible to extinguish the Holy Spirit. I mean, if there's a, a command here not to extinguish the Spirit of God, then it might mean that we could potentially extinguish the Holy Spirit. But we know that this responsibility is not implying that we can uh, extinguish the Holy Spirit. Why? Because as we saw from Lesson 13, we have already learned that as a believer, we will never under any circumstance lose the indwelling Spirit uh, in our life. So what does this quenching of the Spirit mean for the believer? Well, why are believers commanded not to quench the Spirit in this church age of grace? Well, if the Holy Spirit already permanently indwells us. Well, to quench the Spirit is a choice that the believer makes. The, to quench the Spirit means, in effect, to say no to the manifestations and the revelations of the will of God. One major way we can determine the will of God is to study his word to apply it to life. I can remember vividly an instance where a believer came up to me and said, hey, would it be against God's will to marry an unbeliever? I said, yeah. Let me show you from the word where we can go. Another instance would be if you have two individuals living together. The culture, what does the culture say? <laughs> it's normal today, right? It's normal to live together before marriage. What does the word say? 1 Thessalonians 4.3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. What about Romans 13, verse 14? But put on the Lord Jesus Christ 
and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Now, for one to completely disregard those clear passages of Scripture where the will of God has been, has been laid bare for the reader, to then choose to live with your boyfriend or girlfriend would be to quench the Spirit. To quench the Spirit of God is like saying this, I know what the Word of God is saying about this situation, but, right? And then all the excuses start flowing after that. Or it might be, I know that the Spirit of God is leading me to do this, however, right? No, the believer who is yielding to the Spirit of God through the Word of God will apply God's truth to daily life. And one thing that is uh, true of every believer is this. We are either doing one of two things. We are either living each moment submitting to the control of the Spirit or rebelling against His control. And that would be true of you, that would be true of, of me this morning, in this moment. I love what Dwight Pentecost said about the quenching of the Spirit. He said, in many books on the ministries of the Spirit of God, this matter of control by the Spirit or the filling of the Spirit is made such a complicated process that I don't see how anybody could ever know the joy of it. Yet God's truth concerning the filling by the Spirit is so simple. And I love how he puts that. It's so simple. It's so simple. We complicate it, but it's simple. Hard. It's hard. Is it easy to say, hey, my life, I'm going to give it over to you. I'm going to allow someone else to control my life. Is that easy? No. Simple, but difficult. Um, I want to ask, Pastor Brad, you're in the back there. Pastor Brad, you've counseled a lot of people since I've been here. Have you ever had someone um, regret uh, following the word and walking closely with the Lord? No. No. Someone who's yielded to the Spirit of God. Do you find shame? No. Joy. You'll see joy, right? Yeah. Second responsibility we find in the New Testament. Do not grieve the Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Spirit of God, Ephesians 4.30. Um, I like the Star Wars franchise. I'm old school Star Wars, I guess. The force is an energy that exists in those movies, and you can't grieve an energy force, but you can grieve the Spirit of God. As we've already learned, the Spirit of God is a person. If we, in a moment, choose to quench the Spirit of God, that's going to lead to the grieving, His grieving within us. The first part of Ephesians 4.30 um, it says this, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Well, how do we grieve the Spirit of God? Well, we grieve the Spirit of God if unconfessed sin in our life, when we, when we give ourselves over to sinful attitudes and actions. And the Holy Spirit, as we've already studied, is a person and, he, and is holy since he's God. And so the, the indwelling presence of this holy person in our lives ex- explains for the reality that the Holy Spirit will be grieved in our lives if unconfessed sin is present in any form. John Walford got it right when he stated this about Uh, that passage, Ephesians 4.30. He said that that verse is an appeal to allow nothing in his life contrary to the holiness of the Spirit. It is clear that the one cause of grieving the Holy Spirit is sin. That Greek word for grieve in this verse is again the same as 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Grieve is a verb, present, active, imperative. And so the responsibility is with that, with that active form, it's up to the believer to fulfill. There are no excuses in Scripture not to fulfill this responsibility, nor are there any reasons given that might suggest that we should actively attempt to grieve the Spirit of God under any circumstances. Again, the command is simple, yet hard. Why? Because we battle the flesh, right? The flesh, we battle it. 
doesn't matter how old you are in your, your walk with Christ, how young you are in your walk with Christ. There is that internal battle that goes on. Galatians 5. Now, if we persist in resisting the Holy Spirit and we continue on a path where we have deviated from the will of God, then the Holy Spirit can no longer direct and bless us through his ministry. And so this progression of events will lead to the grieving of the Spirit of God. And the outcome is detrimental to the spiritual growth of the believer. When we fail to deal with sin in our lives, um, when we grieve the Spirit of God, when we quench His work in us, it is then that we're going to experience a, a loss of fellowship with, with our Heavenly Father. And, and that process of the Spirit's desire to develop the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, that process will also be hindered. By the way, I, I love the fruit of the Spirit. I want the fruit of the Spirit in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience. This world says you'll find all of that in yourself. <laughs> There's a better way for those of us who know Christ. There's a better way. That leads me to our third responsibility, walk in the Spirit of God. Walk in the Spirit of God, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. I was at Frontier School of the Bible. As a new believer, Nelson Miles taught on the Holy Spirit, and he gave a helpful illustration that helped me in my walk with, with Christ. I wanted to share this with you. It's been a blessing to me over the years. <clears throat> the illustration goes like this. How many of you have ever had a, a blueberry smoothie? All right. How many of you love blueberries? Okay. How many of you like um, shakes or smoothies, I should say, <laughs> smoothies? All right? You can't go wrong when you combine the two, a smoothie and a, and, a, and a blueberry, right? Now imagine extracting that glorious blueberry smoothie through a straw, right? In, in a moment, that experience could almost be described as heavenly, right? I mean, all of your cares and your concerns in the world, they've kind of left you, and, and your taste buds are having a party in your mouth, Right? What happens when, you, when a blueberry gets stuck in, in the straw? <laughs> you lose out on that goodness that you've just experienced. And it'll happen without warning. All of a sudden, it's like you hit a wall, right? And you'll do anything you can to get that blueberry out of the straw. You'll probably replace the straw for a new one. Now, this, this illustration falls a bit short. But I believe it's a pretty good picture for, for spiritual lives. That smoothie and, and the enjoyment of it is like our fellowship with, with God. When we're in fellowship with Jesus Christ, it's a sweet deal. It's even better than a blueberry smoothie, but, but since we wrestle with the flesh, since we wrestle with, with the old man, we have been freed from the, the penalty and the power of sin to live for God, amen? But we have yet to experience um, the... the um, being delivered from the presence of sin. We have yet to experience that. And so when sin comes, sin is like that blueberry that gets stuck in the straw. So what do we do with those blueberries that come up? We confess them. We confess them to the Lord. And he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of all sin. If you would turn with me to Galatians 5. I'd love, I'd love this. Galatians 5. I believe you're in Ephesians right here, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Again, Paul is writing to believers, and in this chapter clearly explains the battle that goes on within every believer that, go, that is found within this church age of grace. Verse 16 and verse 17 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So what's going on here is this very real tension that exists within each of us who know Christ. And the responsibility here is to walk by the spirit. So that is, this next, that is what this next result will, will take place. So as verse 16 says, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. It is true to say that we, have all, we all have fleshly desires. The Greek word for desire in verse 16 is also used of Paul, excuse me, of Peter, when he writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. 
As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance. So then, what is the antidote? What is the key to spiritual victory? It's this, walk by the Spirit. I've said it before, I'll say it again. We cannot live the Christian life. It must be by faith in Jesus Christ, enabled by the Holy Spirit. When we depend on the self, that is when we fall flat on our face. We need to depend on him. Two of these responsibilities are negative in nature. Do not quench the Spirit of God. Do not grieve him. But this responsibility takes a different turn. It is that the believer has been called to walk by the Spirit. And we would say that this certainly is a a positive responsibility that we are called to. The Greek word for walk in Galatians 5.16, it's a verb, present, tense, active, form, imperative. It's a command rather than a suggestion. We are called to walk by the Spirit of God. Inasmuch as the Spirit of God dwells within the believer, the believer is exhorted to walk by his person and his power. A walk implies a moment-by-moment, step-by-step relationship, and so it is. If you would turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. I've got you in Galatians now. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Paul, again, he's writing to believers And speaks to them about their fellowship with one another as well as their fellowship with Christ. In chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, we read, For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Walk in him. When were we indwelled with the Spirit of God? We were indwelled with the Spirit of God at salvation, that he might never leave us. We received him by faith in the Son of God. Victory, therefore, is obtainable not by our own strength, but is only obtainable through a moment-by-moment dependence upon the Spirit of God. That's how. You want victory in your walk with Christ. Then get serious about your fellowship with Christ. It was one thing to hear this truth while at Bible school. It's quite another to experience the reality of this truth after a a decade of full-time ministry. Listen, you and I have tasks and works that God has ordained for us, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, but we can't do ministry on our own. We can't do it on our own. Our efforts for Christ will be paralyzed if we are relying on self to get the job done. No, ministry is a spiritual work, and if we're going to make an impact for Christ, then we need to be dependent upon the Spirit of God. I believe that a church where leaders are walking in the Spirit, I believe that that church will have a huge impact in this Christ. But the commands that we find here are not just for the, the leaders in a church. They are for every believer Those responsibilities that have been outlined here, they are for all of us. And if we are walking in fellowship with Christ, walking by his his spirit, enjoying the sweet taste of fellowship that is so much greater than a, a blueberry smoothie, then two realities will be true. First, the first reality that's true of a believer who's walking by the spirit in fellowship with Christ, keeping short accounts of sin in his or her life for starters, Uh, will not be one who is quenching the Spirit of God. This will allow the person of the Spirit to work powerfully through the believer's life. The second reality that's true of a believer who's walking by the Spirit is this, that they will not be grieving the Spirit because they are enjoying His presence as they go through the week. A believer who who consistently quenches and grieves the Spirit of God is truly missing out on the joy that belongs to them through Christ. Now, I would go so far as to say that a believer who quenches or grieves the Spirit really can really hinder the work that God wants to do within the body of Christ. A Greek scholar, Kenneth Wiest, observed this um, about the third resp- responsibility that we have as believers. He said, The secret of victory over sin is found 
not in attempted obedience to the law that has been abrogated, but in subjection to a divine person, the Holy Spirit, who at the moment the sinner places his faith in the Lord Jesus, takes up his permanent residence in his being for the purpose of ministering to his spiritual needs. The law cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit. It cannot produce spiritual victory, nor will some other counterfeit. Self-help, psychology, all of that looks to the self. It looks to the self. The command is present. Be filled with the Spirit of God. We're filled when we are walking in fellowship with Jesus Christ, keeping short accounts of sin. You know, the world, for whatever reason, uh, and in some cases may have a right to this observation, looks at Christianity and uh, sees not the blessing of being in fellowship with Christ. How can I judge it? I was in that camp at one time. But when you trust, as, trust in Christ as Savior and you've tasted that sweet fellowship with Jesus Christ, why would you ever want to go back to Egypt, right? Why would you ever want to go back there? Why would you ever want to live life apart from that sweet fellowship with Christ? That is the question. Sin satisfies for the moment, but for the believer, sin leaves a sour taste in the mouth. Now, in our next lesson, we're going to study the results of being filled with the Spirit of God and what will begin to take place in your life and mine when we are walking in the Spirit over a long period of time. We talked about spirituality, that spirituality can happen in a moment. You can be filled with the Spirit of God in a moment's time. We can go through seasons of life where we are not um, filled with the Spirit, and that hinders our maturity, our spiritual maturity. Maturity is um, that takes a longer period of time. And so I want to encourage you to be here for this next lesson next week uh, because what we, we will study, it's going to serve as the dashboard of life. If those results are found in our lives and they are increasing, then we can determine if we have been yielding to the Spirit of God or not, I believe. It'll be a, a convicting lesson but one that every believer ought to consider daily. Which leads us to our truth that we saw today. God has given various responsibilities in the New Testament that will cause one to be filled with his spirit. Perhaps you're here today or you're listening online and you've been living this week with a, a blueberry stuck in the straw, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Unconfessed sin in your life. I would encourage you to get before the Lord and uh, confess that sin to him and move forward in the freedom that he has given to you. God's word says that we cannot afford to live in carnality. There is something better for us instead, and we will see that better something. And we're going to see what that better something is in our next lesson. Let me pray. And uh, we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, we give you praise. And we want to thank you uh, for this tremendous work of your spirit. Thank you that you have saved us and um, that you desire that we would walk in fellowship with you moment by moment daily. You have that desire that we would be walking with you in relationship with you. And we give you praise for that. We thank you for that joy that is there. Uh, for any that are here today or listening online who have perhaps uh, not been yielding to your word, to your spirit, uh, perhaps have uh, unconfessed sin in their life, I pray that you would um, bring, bring conviction through your spirit there, that confession may be done and uh, that they can move forward in freedom. Father, we thank you for the joy, again, that it is to know you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, died on the cross for the sin of the world, rose again, offering new life to any who will believe in him, that we can come into a right relationship through faith in Jesus Christ. We give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. All right.